Okay, well, I'm Margie Sable, and I used to be a programmer at KOPN uh, long ago, from 1978 to 1981. Uh, I worked on, um, I was one of the morning air programmers. I worked with the Crystal Set Feminists to do the Moon of Artemis show on Sunday afternoons, which we rotated among the different members. And I had a show called The Brazen Hussy, and my name was, uh, my radio name was Rosie O'Reilly. So uh, I talked to someone, Vic Day, about my experiences at KOPN, but now I'm here with Al Tacker. And uh, I met Al, I met you at KOPN when I, you were already here, you were already doing programming when I moved to Columbia in 1978. And um, we've just kind of known each other through the years, and here we are in 2022, and <laughs> with our gray hair. And <laughs> I'd like to know. I'd like to know. Uh, I know you did public affairs shows, uh, among other things, and I'd like to know how you got involved with KOPN. Well, I, was, I really kind of been interested in radio, and you know, always fantasized that it'd be cool to be in the radio someday, and. And then when I heard about the New Wave Corporation trying to develop the station, I started attending the meetings. So I was here at the planning meetings, and I was really around right from the very beginning. I, uh, at, at the time that we started, there weren't any air openings, but oh, only the air openings came really quickly around here. People came and went and were sometimes dismissed without warning and you know, stuff like that. So I, I think probably just two or three weeks after we went on the air, I was awarded the midnight to 3 a.m. shift on Saturday night. And uh, it, was a, it was kind of comforting because, because I knew that not many people could hear us with our 10-watt signal and even fewer were listening, so I didn't have to be too nervous about speaking to a wide audience. Were you doing pro public affairs or were you playing it was, music? It was, it was music. It, it was uh, you know, album, album rock, basically, at that time. Um, you know, one of the things that that I've noticed is, is that we did a lot of things that weren't being done in the Columbia market. And Columbia was a very small radio market at the time. There were the two AM stations and a couple of top 40 FM stations and KVIA, which was all classical music, and the Stevens station, which was all inaudible more than a mile away. And so we did a lot of things that were being done in other markets. Or maybe, and we obviously did a lot of things that weren't being being done that were really creative. But I think the things Can that I was involved in. Can you give an example? In, well, the stuff you were you were worked in the, the feminist uh, programming, and uh, but so, but I mean, stuff that that I was involved in were all things that weren't being done in Columbia, and uh, and that in, included album-oriented rock music um, for a. A long time, I had a, an after, a Tuesday afternoon show called Free Lunch, and the free referred to kind of free-form music and a variety of folk, rock, pop. Uh, I did a lot of thematic shows. Uh, once a month, I would go to the Historical Society and look up the uh, newspapers from 10 years earlier and uh, convey the news as well as the music, play the, play the top 10 songs and other music from that era. And... Uh, had did another a uh, number of other thematic. I had, a, I had a show that was all about time, and every song I played had some unit of time in it. Uh, so you know, it's just trying. It just it was an opportunity to just do something different and creative. Did you bring guests to your show for for the music shows for free lunch? Uh, Probably I not from the midnight to three a.m. But. <laughs> Midnight to 3 a.m., I, I knew that by like 2.30 there was nobody out there. So <laughs> it was, I've just put on a, like, a, you know, in a got it a beat or something very long to just, just let it run for a long time. But uh, How about with free lunch? Did you have any guests? Not with free lunch per se, but uh, later on with uh, my future wife, Mary Jo, uh, we had a program called Monday, Monday, uh, first thing Monday morning. And we brought in a number of different people, you know, University people, political people, and we interviewed them. The kind of thing that after we had started doing that, KFRU started doing. And we kind of realized, you know, they had a bigger budget and more opportunity to do things, and we kind of just dropped So you that. had a good idea. They heard it, and they took it, ran we, we with were, it. I, yeah, but we also had the only oldie show, uh, old rock 
show. I remember your old rock show. And, <laughs> and, and then there's a whole station that, that came on, and that's all he did. So, yeah, I think we did things that other stations probably heard and thought, hey, that's a good idea, and took them from us, and they had the bigger budget and and more records, and, and so we kind of moved on and did something different. I remember you, well, I know you were on the city council, you eventually ran for city council and you were on the city council uh, here in Columbia, but before that you were doing public affairs programs and, and interviewing people, candidates and things like that. Can you talk about that program? Yeah, well, I ran for mayor in 1973 as a 20-something 20, 20 uh, long-haired hippie and didn't, I finished third out in a four-way race, I figured that was a victory. But, but after that, very shortly after that, uh, KOPN started, and uh, we broadcast the city council meetings, which eventually uh, ended up, I guess, on, like, on cable TV. Uh, but again, I have, would have interviews associated with that, but pretty much we just broadcast gavel-to-gavel -gavel coverage of the city council. And then, I guess, stemming from that, we had public affairs, uh, covered events, um, covered speeches, a, a couple of the people that we covered included Dean McCarthy after he'd run for president and uh, uh, Joe Teasdale, who was the, act the actual governor of Missouri. And so I guess one of the questions uh, was, who are the most famous people that you've met in this process? And it's probably those two. Uh, but we also, there was one year when there were like eight candidates for uh, state rep, I think. and. It was a race that Wendell Bailey eventually ended up winning, but we had all eight of those candidates up here at KOPN. And, uh, so that was a really good only, public service only, for yeah. KOPN's listeners. Yeah, it would have been the only opportunity, because nobody else is doing that, the only opportunity for candidates to get on the radio and for, for people to hear them. It's kind of funny to think about that now, because you hear candidates on the radio all the time, but I guess in those days, that not so much. Yeah, I think it was something like you know, 20 or 25 uh, candidate forums for city council candidates this year. And, uh, you know, w when I was active politi politically, there were like three or four and maybe a couple times on the radio, but that was it. So, you know, again, I think the, one of the real strengths of KOPN was the willingness and the ability to innovate and do things that weren't being done. I remember it a lot with music that we, our mantra was we play things that aren't played on other radio stations. And, that's, that's for sure. And I learned yeah. so much about so many musicians I had never heard of mm -hmm. before I started working here. Um, I guess um, you developed a lot of your skills through working at, at KOPN, is that right? Right, I had no training in those skills and no, no education related to radio beforehand. So. Do you think that was true of most of the programmers? I'm, I'm pretty sure it was. The, there were some interesting management styles in the old days. You would, you would come up one time and your mailbox would be gone. That was a signal that you were no longer on the air. Or you would go in for your shift and somebody else was there. I mean, this didn't happen to me, but it happened to other people. And uh, it, it was, for a communication medium, there wasn't all that much internal communication in the early days. How do you think the station has changed since the time that you were involved? Uh, I think it's probably a lot more professional. I think there's probably more consistency in terms of the quality of programming and programmers because we really were doing it from scratch and uh, you know just just having to sign a release for this uh, for this video it, it's, it's something we never would have ever <laughs> we never would have about. done right So um, we did a lot of things. Uh, at the station, a lot of events and concerts and things like that. Do you remember f a favorite event, or I, do any of any of the things that we did outside of broadcasting on radio stand out to you? I was a stage guard for an Ozark Mountain Daredevils concert, and I was here, and the speaker was here, and I think I still have hearing loss from that concert. <laughs> <laughs> was that KOPN sponsored? Yeah, yeah. And, yeah, you know, we had a, had a lot of good people up here. We had a lot of good people, yeah. One one thing that um, that was really out of character, uh, based on the rest of our programming, was getting into sports. And um, there were the two AM stations, and one of them was broadcasting 
Hickman basketball and, and football, the other was broadcasting Rock Bridge. And the station broadcasting Rock Bridge suddenly said, now we're not going to do any sports anymore. And so I, I think it was probably Bill Wax who came up with the idea of, well, why doesn't KOPN do that, to fill in that gap? And uh, so I, I was part of that broadcast team, which included Tom Doerr, former Missouri, seven foot one Missouri basketball player. And uh, so we were on that broadcast along with some other, a couple of other guys. But Tom went on to become the voice of the Chicago Bulls basketball team. And, uh, and, I, and also I think he was a, a Southeast Conference broadcaster for quite a while. So he, he was one of the people that uh, got his first uh, professional experience here. Yeah, and speaking of that, um, there are some other people that went on, that started out here as volunteers and went on to have careers in radio. I know Bill Wax did, um, became a, you know, a national blues programmer. Uh, can you think of other people that went on to do other, on to do more radio in their professional lives? It seems like I cannot remember the name, but the person that first did NPR's business show um, got his start here at KOPN and then, then went on to uh, to initially start that show. Yeah, there were a lot of uh, J school students, journalism school students who came here to go to journalism school and then volunteered at KOPN. I think Bill, well, not Bill, but uh, Brian Mann was one and Jim Zeroli. I didn't interact interface with with Jim Zeroli, but I knew Brian and hear him on NPR now. You know, the programmer that followed me one one time uh, during one of my shows was George Ann Wheeler, who went on to marry Jay Nixon and become the first lady of Missouri. Right. She was a, a programmer here. So uh, how important was KOPN to you in terms of your your friendships and circle of friends? Well, Mary Jo claims that she thought I was probably okay to date because she'd heard me on KOPN. <laughs> <laughs> I'd, I'd never heard before, but of course she told me that today. Yeah. But, but yeah, I got a lot, a lot George of George had heard me too. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. A, a lot of my friends uh, during that time period were people that I met here. And uh, the interesting thing is I'd go to a party there in, in the you know, late 70s, early 80s. I they, remember they, those they parties. They KOPN parties. They were just, you know, other other people of our generation. And it seems like the major topic of conversation was always about what was going on at KOPN. Who, who had gotten unfairly treated, who who had been promoted, um, what the what kind of programming changes had been made, that kind of thing. But it seems like that was always the topic of conversation. I think we were really a major portion of of the whole culture of, of our generation. Well, that's a great way to close. I think that's, uh, I agree with that. It really was, it was a culture that existed here that, uh, and, a, and almost a society, you know. It was, it was almost the center of, I would say of Columbia, but of, of Columbia for our age and maybe countercultural, but, but not entirely. But I think an awful lot of people identified with KOPN and were very, very interested in it, very concerned about what happened here. I, I, I was one of the few programmers doing at least some popular top 40 music uh, mixed, mixed in with a lot of other things because there was kind of that bias of, you know, that we're alternative, we don't do the kind of stuff. And I did kind of mix some of the stuff that everybody else was doing here along, along with stuff that was on the radio more generally. But there was a, a way to blend, to blend that kind of stuff together. How have you used the skills that you got at KOPN in the many years of your career since then? I think I probably developed some more confidence in terms of talking and talking in public. Uh, and you know, that, that did me well through my career. Uh, well, one thing I, that you, at the time that I started, you had to get a, I think it was a third class radio operator's license. Right. I had, to, had to go to Kansas City and take the test. And, and the only real skill that I got out of that was walking over, and our, our tower was on top of Pac, uh, Paquin Towers at the time, was every hour I think I had to go over there at night and look out the window and make sure that light was on so low, low flying aircraft wouldn't uh, crash into our, our uh, broadcast tower. So that was, that was a skill I learned. <laughs> <laughs>
but I, but I think more more generally, uh, just in terms of learning how to talk and talk to groups and um, be less nervous about doing that kind of thing. I think those were all skills I picked up here. Well, thanks for your time and thanks for the memories. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Margie. <laughs>